also symmetric orbifolds. Um, this is some sort of overview over various results uh, we have obtained together with uh, a couple of collaborators, Alex Bellin, who is in the audience, Alex Melody, Aida Sade, and also Beatrix Mühlmann. Um, I will probably more concentrate on the older results because um, Aida Sade already gave a talk here about the most recent results, namely the Genus 2 and Rennie Entropy results a couple of weeks ago, although I realize that there may not be too much of an overlap in the audience from back then to now. Um, so what's the, what's the general idea? Uh, what are we interested in? Well, we are interested in the large end limit of two-dimensional conformal C uh, uh, CFTs. And sort of the broader motivation is that uh, we would, so I say large N, uh, equivalently you can also think about it in terms of large C for the types of theories that I'm looking at. Um, the general philosophy is a bit that we would like to understand better the space of conformal field theories, more concretely the space of conformal field theories in two dimensions with large N. And then in particular, we would like to understand uh, the space of holographic conformal field theories in the large end limit. And um, so the, question, the types of questions that we would ask, for instance, the, the very first questions when I write, you might ask when I write down this uh, statement that we're interested in large end limit, the first question would be, well, does this limit, uh, does this limit exist in the first place? And um, definitely a necessary condition for this uh, limit to exist is simply that the uh, number of states has to remain finite as you send C to infinity. So s say you have a family of conformal field theories parameterized by some parameter n with some density of states um, rho n. And then you want this limit here of n going to infinity uh, to make sense. So you want them rho n to um, converge or more precisely rho n for a fixed delta, you want that to converge to some density of states, rho infinity um, delta, which should be smaller than infinity. And already this condition here is um, highly non-trivial. For instance, if you were challenged to give an example of a family of uh, theories uh, where you have some parameter n which you can send to infinity, then the first example you might write down is simply uh, you might start out with your favorite two-dimensional conformal field theory, maybe a free boson, maybe something slightly more complicated, and then you would take uh, just a naive tensor product of n copies of such theories. And obviously this theory here will have a central charge which is n times the um, uh, central charge of the theory, so the underlying theory I will of often call the seed theory. And then, you know, this is a family of CFTs where you can send n to infinity. But obviously the point is that this theory here, this family of theories here, does not have a well-defined large n limit simply because the number of states will diverge. So there's simply too many states at weight at a given energy level. Um, so what can we do to get rid of that problem? Well, the obvious um, uh, thing that we can try to do is we can try to impose some orbifold, which basically means we throw out a lot of states, and the hope is that we throw out enough states, in particular enough light states, such that we remain, remain with a finite number of states so that this here is well defined. So what we can do is we can use the fact that if we take a, a tensor product of theories, this theory obviously has a very large symmetry group. In particular, it's symmetric on the permuting different factors. So what you can do is you can try to orbifold um, by a family of permutation groups Gn. Their permutation groups are in particular um, their subgroups of the full symmetric group Sn. And maybe you've never thought about this construction here, but you've definitely all thought about this construction here, the full uh, symmetric orbifold. So this, is the, this would be the, the most famous example, uh, the symmetric orbifold. And sort of the goal of this uh, work is to investigate uh, cousins of this symmetric orbifold, namely permutation orbifolds, that is, um, orbifolds with uh, by smaller permutation groups. And the idea is, uh, as we'll see, that um, all symmetric orbifolds have relatively universal properties, and the hope is that if we explore a slightly larger space of theories, that we will discover new theories which may have new and interesting features which are different from symmetric orbifold theories. And then the hope is, of course, that these interesting theories are still holographic so that they satisfy 
all the conditions that we would like to impose on holographic theories. And then maybe if we're extremely lucky and this goes way beyond what we have done, we might be able uh, to construct a gravity tool to this, these theories. But I will definitely not talk about this aspect. This is sort of the very, very long-term goal. So um, the idea is in that sense to investigate the landscape of such permutation orbifolds, and then we can ask uh, several questions, for instance, uh, for which uh, families uh, for which families GN uh, uh, does the limit exist? And then um, once uh, we find certain such families, then we can, of course, um, ask what other properties do they have? Um, for instance, uh, what do they have phase transitions? What does, does the phase diagram look like, et cetera, et cetera? And more generally, you can sort of ask whether they um, satisfy additional conditions that you'd expect from um, holographic theories. So there's uh, various things involving, for instance, uh, the genus 1 partition function or correlation functions or the genus 2 partition functions, which you can sort of investigate um, on this space of permutation or befolds. Um, so let's first uh, talk about the, the first question here. So wha what is the condition um, that we end up with a finite number of states at a given level? And um, sort of the on, a, on a technical level, the, under, the underlying um, principle of these um, large n limits of permutation or before is that essentially all the questions you can ask, or at least at the level we are asking them can be reduced um, to questions in combinatorics, basically. So some questions of um, uh, uh, properties, simple group theoretic properties of permutation or befalls. And so let's, let's try to rewrite this question of whether there's a finite number of states in terms of combinatorial data. And what's, what's the idea? Uh, you know, we, we let's consider um, untwisted states in the orbifold theory. Uh, how do we obtain untwisted states? Well, we start out with a state in the tensor product theory. Uh, for instance, such a state would look like something like we take um, a state phi 1 in the underlying theory 1, and then we tensor it with a state in the second factor. And for instance, we take the vacuum in the second factor, and then maybe again the vacuum, then something like phi 2, etc., etc., all the way, um, say, to uh, phi k. And total there's uh, capital N such factors here. And all those um, states here live in C. And the first important observation is, well, basically what I said is we want this um, density of states to remain finite at even finite energy. In order to get a finite energy, what we have to ensure is that most of the states that appear here are the vacuum. Because if, they're, if the number of non-vacuum states scales with n, then of course the total conformal weight, which is simply the, w the sum of the weights here, will diverge. So that will be a heavy state. And in that sense, we're only interested in light state. So the idea is that we'll have a finite number, say k non-trivial factors, and all the other factors will simply be the vacuum. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this number k here will appear over and over again. And the idea is that k is fixed, independent of n, as we send n to infinity. Now, the point is this is a state in the tensor product theory, but it's obviously not a state in the untwisted sector of the orbifold theory, simply because it's not invariant under action of the, of the orbifold group of Gn. So if, if we call this thing here, um, uh, say, lowercase phi, uh, what, how, how would we construct a state which is actually invariant under the full um, orbifold? Well, um, so let me do it by capital phi, um, the, uh, the state, the invariant state in the orbifold theory. What we do is we simply sum over all elements of G n, and then we act uh, with G on this underlying state phi here. And what's the action of G? Well, basically G is a permutation. So what does it do? It simply permutes the different factors here in the appropriate way. And so in group theoretic language, this means that uh, the state here uh, corresponds uh, to an orbit of the group Gn. And now the point is that we've um, 
reduce the, the question of how many states there are, or at least if there are finitely many states or not, um, to a question of how many orbits um, ac does um, the group GN have. Uh, that statement is not terribly well defined, so let me define it slightly uh, more precisely. So let's call um, F sub K of GN is equal to the number of orbits um, and I mean, you can basically, uh, those, those qualifications here, or the precise definitions don't matter too much, but let me still write them down. So the number of orbits um, under the action of GN on the set of ordered K tuples of distinct integers. So again, it doesn't really matter too much. The idea is that the K tuples basically they um, parameterize which factor in which factor phi one lives, in which factor phi two lives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then this is just simple standard action of um, G n on those um, orbits. And so we have we have um, these um, f k uh, G n, and then um, uh, just to introduce some um, terminology, um, which will be which is important because it's exactly equivalent to the statement that um, there's a, uh, that this limit exists so that there's a finite number of states. Uh, we say a family of uh, permutation orbifolds, GN, is, and uh, there's this word, it's called oligomorphic. And oligo basically means uh, few, so there's the idea is that there's only a few number of orbits if uh, for all K, um, these numbers of orbits of Gn actually converge for n to infinity to some fixed number fk, which again is smaller than infinity. Um, so this is a slightly more technical statement than this uh, observation here that again as, as this um, observation here or the condition here that as we send n to infinity the number of states should be remain finite. And sort of already by this argument, you can sort of see that indeed, if the number of orbit remains finite, then at least in the untwisted sector, it's from what I've said, it's almost obvious that the number of untwisted states will remain finite. Actually, you can argue a bit more carefully, and then you can also see that the number of twisted states remain finite. So basically, this is a uh, necessary and sufficient condition for um, uh, a family of um, permutation groups, GN, to lead to a uh, family of C has a well-defined limit n to infinity in terms of the spectrum. Um, let's uh, let me give you uh, a few examples. Um, so, sort of, this is the simply the the condition that the finite number of states. But let me uh, discuss a few examples and then also give. Uh, you some idea of what the actual growth of, of states looks like, what this phi rho of delta actually looks like. Um, oh, the first example is uh, again the most famous example where you just take uh, this permutation group or this family of permutation groups GN to be the symmetric groups. And in that case, as you can convince yourself easily, f k is simply one. Uh, the point is, if you have a, you know, you, you have a k tuple of distinct integers, you can always find a permutation element which maps it to one, two, three, dot, dot, dot to n. Um, so uh, this means that this family of groups is certainly oligomorphic, which is what you expected from the very beginning, because you know we all know that uh, the large end limit of symmetric orbifolds is well defined. Uh, so this this part of the question is is, is very easy to answer. Uh, then, uh, but then you know you 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 don't not only care about the existence of the limit, but you'd also like to know um, what the uh, what the spectrum actually looks like. So you're interested in the in uh, the the density of states rho infinity of delta, and there you can you know do a slightly uh, more careful analysis. And what you find is uh, that the number of states grows exponentially uh, like e to the 2 pi delta. And actually this is sort of the first time that I, I made this remark that essentially um, everything is determined in these um, permutation overfalls, everything is determined by combinatorics, uh, which 
is actually not quite true, but it's true here in the sense that if, if you look at the result, then you may wonder, well, we have this underlying seed theory, this C, and somehow this none of the information shows up in this result here. So this thing here is, uh, this result here is universal in the sense that it does not depend on the underlying uh, uh, seed series. So for take uh, the D1, D5 system, it doesn't matter if you put it on T4 or, or, or on K because those lead to two different, a priori, two different seed series. But to leading order, if you're interested in this question here, there's no difference between those two. So, very good. So if, if you're literally going to the row infinity of delta, then it does not depend on the central charge either. But um, maybe I should write uh, the finite n or the finite d result. Um, uh, and the point is, um, the the finite the finite n result. Um, so this is piece of the finite n result, and in particular, the claim is that this. Is true. So here I'm taking the convention that the vacuum has delta equals to zero, which is more convenient here. And then um, basically the, the range of validity of, of, of this growth here is given by uh, delta has to, be be, has to be between zero and Cn over six, where C is indeed the, the, uh, the central charge of the underlying seed theory. And um, then there's also um, the point is that. Um, if n is finite, then this is a perfectly well-defined conformal field theory. So we know at some point Cardi behavior has to kick in, and indeed uh, Cardi behavior does kick in for. Um, so this is the usual uh, Cardi behavior, and I think there's an n here kicks in as soon as delta is uh, is bigger um, than c n over six. Um, so the point is that this um, part here is indeed, indeed independent of the central charge. The range of validity depends on the central charge, and then, of course, the, the Cardi behavior does depend on the central charge. It's fixed in the usual way, and the central charge of the C theory enters uh, through C times N. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, there's... Okay, fair enough. So this is, this is I, I haven't really defined what I mean by this squiggly line here. So what, what we should really take here in this case here, delta should be parametrically larger than one. And then indeed you should be slightly more careful here about what type of corrections could appear. Um, I mean, slightly related to this question and also what is, is universal. Basically the point is that in physics lab, behavior comes from the things. Uh, which basically means in terms of the orbifold group, this comes from twisted sectors which have very long long cycles, and those are indeed uh, essentially independent of the uh, of the seed theory, so independent of, of this uh, uh, capital C uh, conformal field theory here. Whereas if the del delta is indeed very small, then there's contribution, there may be leading contributions from the untwisted sector, and that indeed does depend on uh, the seed theory. Okay. Um, so basically, the the point is that you know in this case we can write down the finite n result, and then this rho infinity result is simply the light the light states of the finite n result. Um, so this is an example that uh, everybody is very familiar with. Uh, so let's uh, write down some examples which are probably a bit less well known. Um, so, what other um, interesting, um, what other interesting permutation orbifolds uh, can we write down? Um, we can define the following, um, uh, the following uh, family of a permutation group. Um, which um, we'll take uh, G n to be the so-called wreath product between S square root n and S square root n. So, I mean, I. For convenience, I take this to be uh, I take to be n as square, so that this is well defined. Uh, that doesn't really matter too much. Uh, what's more important is sort of what's the definition of this um, wreath product symbol here. Um, 
the idea is the following. Um, there's there's a very nice representation of that. What you can do is you can represent. So again, you you know you wanna you wanna permute n factors. Uh, now, what do you do with those factors? You don't uh, write them down linearly, so but you write them down in a square root n times square root n matrix. And now, by definition, the action of this Ries product here is the following. Um, one of the s square root n's permutes, um, say, the, the rows of the matrix. And then there's actually secretly square root n uh, times the, the other s square root n. And basically, the idea is all the other s square root n permute all uh, the elements in a given row um, separately. So there's um, uh, there's an action of all the s square root n's which permute um, the elements of each row uh, individually. So this is still a relatively uh, large group, but you know it's much smaller than the full um, s n uh, symmetric group uh, in particular. Yeah, I, I, you, I, I think you can write it in in that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the the point is that this is indeed a um, is indeed such an oligomorphic group. And the way to see that is basically if you know you have um, say k, uh, you can write your well. The basic idea is you you can write your um, uh, tuple of of k integers by you know marking k entries here, and then you can easily convince yourself that you can always move by by um, applying an appropriate element of this Ries product group here. You can always move your k non-trivial entries to the top uh, to the top left corner, and they they will always be in a matrix which is given by say k times k uh, uh, entries, which means it's independent of n, so it's oligomorphic. So that's that's the click argument. Um, and then, of course, you, you know there's a there's an immediate generalization of that um, you can take the default um, Ries product, uh, basically, you know, s n to the one over d Ries s n over d dot dot dot, and then you know the the idea is simply that rather than taking a um, a matrix, so an in, uh, an object with two indices, you take an object with d indices, and then you act exactly in the same way uh, with you know d different types of um, of symmetric groups. And now the point is that actually for, for those uh, theories, you know, in, in, in the for the symmetric orbifold, there are very powerful expressions of how what the spectrum looks like. So this is why we can actually obtain these results here. Uh, for general permutation groups, it's slightly more complicated, but what you can usually do is you can at least estimate estimate the, the spectrum in the untwisted sector. And in the untwisted sector, you get something like um, rho uh, infinity is given by e to the delta over log of log of log, basically the logarithm um, iterated uh, d times of delta. So this thing here in the untwisted sector is you get something which is um, grows slightly slower than Hagedorn, but it's still uh, much faster than you'd expect from, say, a local uh, quantum field theory in, in any dimensions. Um, now, if, if you look at this um, example here, there's an immediate generalization. Um, this is actually where things get, uh, get quite interesting. Um, so the observation, well, let me just give you, first give you the generalization. So here we wrote everything in terms of the action of, of this matrix here, and then we had an individual square root n acting on each of the of the rows separately. Now what you can do is you can define a, a group which is um, isomorphic uh, to the direct product of s uh, square root of n with itself, uh, which acts in the following way. Again, the first s square root n acts exactly in the same way, so it just permutes the different rows. But then there's only a single s square root on n which uh, permutes all the columns. So here we had square root n individual s square root n symmetric groups which permuted the elements in the columns individually. But now we just want to have a single one which permutes everything. 
And basically by the same argument here, so the Epoides group is much, much smaller than the wreath product that we wrote down. Um, it's still an oligomorphic group. And uh, so this, it has a well-defined large n limit. And the, the interesting um, observation here is that actually, um, even though it does have a, a large n limit, uh, the radius of convergence of the partition function that you get is actually zero. Uh, the point is that rho of infinity of delta, like delta to the d minus one delta. So if you try to write down, you know, the, the standard partition function, this thing here, then actually, I mean, strictly speaking for, because we're the only in the untwisted sector and for other reasons, this is actually a, sorry, so yeah, so this is actually only a lower bound for the number of states, but that's enough because already this growth if d is uh, bigger than one, then you find that um, this partition function here has a radius of convergence zero. And this uh, is sort of in a contrast with the symmetric or default. Uh, I wrote down the expression uh, before. Let me write it down again. In that case, growth. So again, there was a problem with uh, the convergence of the partition function, but this problem only occurred if the temperature was high enough, in particular, if beta um, was smaller than two pi. So there was a Hackathon transition of this in this uh, partition function here, but at least we had a finite radius of convergence. Um, so here we had the, uh, the Hackathon transition at uh, beta equals uh, 2 pi, whereas here, well, depending on how you look at it, you could say there's a Hagedorn transition at um, t equals zero already, or you could just say, you know, there's the, the radius of convergence of this thing here is zero. Um, so, I mean, absolutely, I mean, the, the point is that, strictly speaking, even in this case here, it's, it's certainly not a conformal field theory because, you know, the energy momentum tensor will have canonical norm infinity and all sorts of things go wrong. Um, so in, in that sense, you know, for, for finite n, we absolutely need to have a fine, uh, uh, an infinite radius of convergence. Everything has to be well defined. But there's no guarantee that that will happen in the end to infinity limit. And sort of gravity side, the interpretation of this Hagedorn transition here is that there is a Hawking page phase transition uh, which occurs exactly at beta equals 2 pi. And sort of what makes this um, example here interesting is that this is an indication that if there is indeed a gravity dual to this theory, and we don't know if there is, but if there is, it would be an example where there is no, at least as far as we know, where there is no phase transition. So the idea of the Hawking page transition here is simply that at, the, at very low temperature, um, the, the vacuum dominates, and then at this um, Hagedorn temperature or Hawking page transition, there ha um, or Hawking page temperature, some other black hole configuration, say, which starts to dominate. Whereas in this case here, you would just have, you know, the vacuum technically dominates at temperature zero, but as soon as you turn on the temperature a little bit, there's already some other configuration which possibly uh, smoothly um, starts dominating. So there's no real phase transition there. I, I think that would be one uh, possible interpretation of this. Of this. Okay, then let me uh, switch to correlation functions. Um, here I will again mostly talk about symmetric, uh, what the statement is uh, for the symmetric orbifold. Again, for the symmetric orbifold itself, the, what I'm going to tell you is, uh, is, not, um, uh, is not surprising or maybe not even new. Uh, but then the point is that uh, using using the same technology, one can uh, generalize or uh, to uh, the results to more general permutation or befalls. And the statement is simply um, for a symmetric orbifold. So if we take an SN orbifold. Um, uh, then the statement is to order one, so um, order one, um, the, the symmetric orbifold uh, becomes a generalized free theory. 
um, meaning that all correlation functions factorize. So, or to put it yet another way, you can simply use Wick contractions to reduce everything uh, to the computation of uh, two-point functions. And just to make this statement slightly more precise, if you're wondering sort of what are the fundamental fields of the theory, et cetera, et cetera, the idea is that uh, the what I'll call fundamental fields, so for instance, if uh, generalized free theory, you know, you, you think of the fundamental field, field to be, for instance, phi, and then the field, the general fields of the theory may be something like phi to some power. Uh, so you could also, if you want to borrow some language from um, n equals 4 super young mills, you could also call them, call them uh, uh, single trace fields. And there's basically two uh, 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 different types. Uh, one of them are simply um, uh, non-vacuum fields. in the untwisted sector. So if you remember sort of the, the state that I wrote down initially, which was some orbit, say, of, of this thing here, then the idea would be this is sort of one fundamental field and this is some fundamental field, et cetera, et cetera. And the most general field is just some appropriately linearized product of these things. Uh, so this is the statement in the untwisted sector. Uh, so in, in for this purpose, uh, the vacuum uh, the vacuum factors do not appear at all. And then there's also in the twisted sector, we would have um, cycles of length uh, bigger than one, that is non-trivial um, twist cycles, which would again serve as uh, those fundamental fields. And then the statement is a general state, the general multi-trace operator, if you want, is just going to be an appropriately symmetrized um, product of such um, fundamental fields, of such single trace operators. And then if you want to compute uh, to order O1 um, a uh, correlation function of such states, what you do is you simply take big contractions between uh, those fundamental fields. So exactly the way you would compute a correlation function in a generalized free theory. And so in particular, um, uh, you, you can write down the, the explicit result, uh, say, let's, let's take for simplicity uh, want a three-point function between uh, three states. And let's say for simplicity that we're always taking the same um, field in all of the three states. So there's um, the, the first state, you know, the, or the the i state where i goes from 1 to 3 simply has a ki times uh, the, uh, the, the, the field, the uh, fundamental field um, phi. Um, then uh, you can compute what point functions uh, of these, uh, of these uh, states, of these operators look like. And well, first you need to properly normalize them, and of course, the proper way to normalize them is uh, to set the two-point function to one. But if you do that, then you get a purely combinatorial expression to leading order or to order one, more precisely. In um, in n, you get a purely combinatorial expression, which may even be familiar for you if you've uh, done these types of in generalized free theory. So basically. Uh, the result is going to involve some um, factorials. Um, and it's here. And as I said, this is true. Um, uh, to leading order in n, or more precisely to order 1. So there will be uh, corrections of order 1 over square root n. And again, as promised, um, maybe slightly surprisingly, but maybe also not at all surprising in view of this remark here, this result here, so we are taking a general underlying conformal field theory, which has, you know, highly non-trivial three-point functions, which can depend on a lot of parameters. But then the statement is, uh, to leading order or to order one, to be more precise, the three-point function in a symmetric product is completely 
oblivious to this underlying structure. So this thing here only depends on the combinatorics of the situation, that, it, that, it, it, that is, it depends on how many times you uh, chose your particular state. And again, and again there's um, uh, sort of, uh, this is, um, um, this is a the same expression uh, that you get for um, generalized free theory. So in, if, if, you, if you compute, say, something like phi to the k1, a three-point function involving phi to the k1, um, phi uh, to the k2, phi to the k3, you would get exactly the same result. Again, these factors just come from, how in, from counting in how many ways you can contract um, various, uh, various fundamental fields. So in this is sort of the precise statement of when, when we say uh, Sn is to leading order is a generalized free theory, this is the precise statement, you get exactly the same uh, correlation functions. In the last um, three or four minutes, let me um, just give, uh, oh, and I should say similar results also hold for oligomorphic uh, permutation orbifolds. You have to make a slightly additional assumption, uh, which we call democratic, but um, it's, uh, it's probably too strong assumption. It, there's pr it's probably, morally speaking, true that almost any oligomorphic permutation orbifold will have this factorization property here. Uh, modulo some irreducibility condition or something like that. So let me give you a very, very quick application of this um, coming from genus 2. Um, so we want to compute uh, genus 2 partition functions. Well, maybe first of all, why, would you, why should we care about genus 2 partition functions? There's various reasons. But one of the reasons why we think it might be more interesting than genus 1 partition functions, which we already talked about, is the fact that the genus 1 partition function only depends on the spectrum and it doesn't care about three-point functions, whereas the genus 2 partition function does involve um, uh, three-point functions. So potentially it can tell us much more about the structure of such theories. And um, in some appropriate coordinates, say Schottky coordinates, um, the genus 2 partition function, morally speaking, looks something like this, where if you squint a little bit, um, this stuff here is actually the honest three-point function. That's not quite true, but for our purposes, that doesn't matter too much. And sort of the parameterization that we're taking here is we, we want to look at the genus 2 partition function as uh, uh, a sphere with four punctures, which we have moved, um, the punctures we've moved to 0, 1, infinity, and x, so x is the cross ratio, and then we connect them by two handles, which we uh, parameterize, or two tubes, which we parameterize by the coordinates p1 and p2. And then now in principle, you know, you can um, plug in this result here, in order, and then you can take this result here, and this gives you the answer for the genus 2 partition function for a symmetric orbifold in the large end limit. And for a general genus 2 partition function, you probably don't care too much, but there's at least one special case which you may find, may find interesting. Uh, the example would be uh, to compute the third Rennie entropy uh, of two intervals, uh, which are, say, given by uh, the interval 0 y and the second one say by i infinity and then there's uh, the usual uh, 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 replica trick going to higher genus surface etc etc i won't go into that but roughly speaking what happens is that um, as a function of this y um, again relatively morally speaking um, the z of y grows like the square of the three-point function again, so you get that from here, and then the y just enters through some, in general, very uh, complicated coordinate transformation. Again, for the purpose of the talk, let me just write down and pretend um, the sort of the leading um, expression in y, so you get some the coordinate y to some power here. And now, in a sense, this looks again very similar to the genus one partition function. So, in particular, depending on how fast these coefficients grow here, if they grow exponentially, this thing here will have a finite radius of convergence. So, there will be a phase transition in this uh, third Rennie entropy. And the point is, if you stare at this expression here, uh, then you'll actually find um, that it grows uh, exponentially, like three, two to 
the main, the leading contribution when summing here, you get for k1 equals k2 equals k3. So it grows like this. And then if you translate that back into um, conformal dimensions, what you find is that it grows like 2 to the um, h over h um, phi, where this h phi is um, the, the field here. And this is actually quite different from the previous result because now you see this coefficient here depends on h phi. In particular, if h phi is the lightest field of the theory, um, this will determine the radius of convergence of, of, of the third Rennie entropy, which tells you that if you choose two different theories, which has two different light fields, potentially um, the, the third Rennie entropy will look different, which is quite different from uh, the genus one, which was completely universal and independent of the theory that you were looking at. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, oh. uh, if you consider a local bulk dual and imagine finite temperature correlation functions, then these things can be written I, as a sum over images either in the thermals, along the thermal circle or along the spatial circle. Do you know? how general a property this is, if at all, of these uh, oligomorphic theories? Um, which, which, which property exactly that you can... The fact that the, the finite temperature correlation functions can be written as a sum over images, either over the spatial direction or the thermal direction. No, I, I, okay. I haven't thought about that. Sorry, the leading order in? I mean, in, in the central charge, somehow you, you have the... Uh, it's, 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 it's the leading order in the central charge. I mean, the, I did, there's been some shifting and rescaling going on, but basically the idea is that um, the, the vacuum contribution would say scale with C, and yes. then if, if you get a, a Hagedorn transition here, again, you would, you would get some, uh, some non-zero or some non-vacuum result, which is again uh, leading in C, yeah, so linear in C, yeah.